بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه مباركا عليه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى جل جلاله وعلى نواله الصلاة والسلام على سيد الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد My dear respected brothers Today it's uh, not a bayan uh, I think it's probably more important than a bayan It relates to what I'm going to speak about today will actually relate to one of the actions that will be asked about first thing in the hereafter and that is Salat we frequently hear about the importance of Salat and that's something which is ingrained in all of our minds I mean we've made an effort to come for the Salat al Asr especially in the month of Ramadan we've made an effort to come to the Masjid to pray our Salat because there's an extra reward for that Salat However, regardless of where anybody performs their salat and their prayer, whether you perform it at home or at work or somewhere when you're traveling, maybe at some service station or at home or in the masjid, there are certain conditions that have to be met. And there are some issues in the prayer which need to be really taken into consideration because they seem to be uh, commonly mistaken issues or people are commonly making mistakes in those issues see salat is something that we do five times a day so what happens in salat is that very few of us will actually concentrate on our salat every single salat every single rak'at every single word that we do many of the time many of our salats unfortunately are performed by autopilot it's a really sad case, but they performed in autopilot. Allahu Akbar. And the next time that we know it, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, that's when we wake up. We're so used to praying, we're so used to performing our salat. We're such professionals at doing it that we can actually do it absent mindedly. Right? We could actually be thinking about, I don't know, entire stories or running our business or planning the next trip or whatever it is. and the actions of the Salat will ensue from our limbs because we're so professional at doing it. I know one person who finishes the reading of a Quran every single day. Not just in the month of Ramadan, but outside the month of Ramadan. He's able to complete an entire Quran in one day. And he does this day in and day out. He works at a post office sorting center. And the job there is so mundane. And he's such a good hafiz of the Qur'an that he can actually just read and absent-mindedly be doing his work. I'm sure he's not absent-mindedly reading, you know. But the thing about the Salat is that we put it, we become so professional at praying that we sometimes don't concentrate. And when we don't concentrate, I've had this interaction with my son as well, right? Sometimes he's noticed me doing something, I've noticed him uh, finishing much quicker. And he's praying next to me and I know that I've read very fast and how can he have done it faster than me? How can he have gone into the Ruku faster than me? Then upon thinking about it, we discovered that what happens sometimes is that for example, you, go, uh, you, you, know, you start the prayer and you say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Sometimes what some people do is that they're actually missing out two, three ayats but they don't realize it Somehow they're skipping from one ayah to another one. They're missing out three ayahs and that's why they're doing it faster. They're not realizing it because we're not concentrating on what we're reading. So it's become a habit. Sometimes it becomes a habit that we're not even speaking out aloud. We're not reading. We're actually thinking. So you see the person standing in prayer and he's like, that salat is not valid. I'll, I'll explain these points uh, in, in specific detail afterwards. But there is a need to think about our prayer. There's probably also a need to actually get somebody else to observe our prayer sometimes and say, can you notice anything? In terms of the postures that we do, are we bending down enough? Are we, are we reposing enough between the different postures to fulfill the wajib of it? So, that's something that we need to really think about because it's our salat and the thing about salat is that it's so frequent 
and that is the challenge in it. Because it's so frequent, can we be concentrating at every point of it? And that is the, the best salat that a person can ever do is the one that he will eventually be concentrating on every aspect of it. According to some, <coughs> some scholars, the fuqaha will just tell you as long as you fulfill these certain obligations, your salat is valid. But the scholars of the heart that look beyond just the fiqh aspects of things, they will, there's one opinion of one scholar is that if you have not thought about Allah and you have not been conscious of your prayer in every single posture of it, then your salat is invalid. <laughs> Which means that if we did one of the prostrations, one of the sajdas absent-mindedly, where we were just happen to be daydreaming, then our salat is invalid according to them. I mean, we could say it's deficient, but from a fiqhi perspective, it will not be invalid. As long as you fulfill the certain, uh, certain, um, uh, certain criteria, certain conditions are met, then the salat will be valid. Here are some of the most common issues that we deal with. I want us to listen to them. I want us to reflect over our own prayers and try to uh, see if we're, doing, if we're doing this in our own prayers. And it's very difficult to discover that in your own prayers. I'll give you an example. Once, after the Tarawi Salat and before the Witr prayer, I mentioned that many people have a habit of placing their forearms on the ground in Sajda. And that is prohibited. There's very clear hadith about that. In, in Muslim, Sahih Muslim, uh, it's made very clear that do not lay your forearms on the ground like a dog does. As bad as that. That's, how, that's what the Prophet said. So I mentioned that many people have a habit of doing this. So what then happens is, what I mentioned that everybody, when they're praying Witr now, it was Ramadan, when we're praying Witr now, if you have noticed, don't look at it for that purpose, but if you notice that your neighbor is doing that, remind him after the Salat nicely. Right? So we, we did this as a group effort. I finished the Salat, I turned around and I saw one man, an older person, right? And the next person is telling him that your arm was on the ground. The person was looking at him in disbelief. I've just mentioned it before the winter started, that don't do this. And he thought he wasn't doing it. And he had done it so absent-mindedly that his neighbor was now reminding him and he was like in disbelief. Did he really do that? So that's why I said it's very difficult because we're so used to it. We just, Allahu Akbar, and we get into this rhythm and we finish our prayer. So it's something to think about and maybe even ask others to, to tell us. It's, it's related about uh, Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anh. They didn't notice that somebody wasn't making a salat properly. In the sense that uh, his, uh, his arkan, his movements and everything wasn't really proper. Now how can you go to an older person and say your salat isn't right? So what they told him was that we want you to see which one of us prays a better prayer. Because we've got a bit of a, a, a difference of opinion about that. Can you observe my our prayer and see which is better? And mashallah, the way they prayed their salat, it made the person reflect and he corrected his prayer. So there are ways of, uh, ways of doing this. The first thing I'd like to clarify beforehand, I mean, we don't have time to go into an in-depth discussion about all the aspects, but one thing is, many people, they'll have a bath. I mean, this is about tahara, this is about purity. Many people will have a bath, a ghusl, where all of their body will become wet, their mouth and nose included. And then they'll be asking, do I still have to do wudu? They've just done a ghusl. But then they'll ask, do I still have to do wudu for the prayer? In the Hanafi school, you don't have to do that. Once the parts of the body that should be washed in wudu become washed, become wet in fact, whether you like it or not, whether by default or by accident or whatever the case is, where you, know, you were in a downpour of rain and your arms, your face, your head and your feet became wet, it, your wudu is done whether you like it or not. You can, you, know, you can refuse and say no, but it will be done. Because niya, is not necessary in the Hanafi school for wudu. In the Shafi school, it'll be a different school. It'll be a different opinion. In the Shafi school, you have to have an intention that that is part of my wudu. Likewise, in the Malikis as well. So, in the Hanafi school, it's quite simple in the sense that once it becomes washed, whether you're doing ghusl or whatever it is, once those parts become washed, you don't have to do wudu anymore. Your wudu is done. When you start the salat, there is obviously the intention and everything. But the main, uh, the one, one thing is when we, when we start our Salat, you see some people, they do these weird styles when they pray, right? Some people, you know, they'll, they'll go, Allahu Akbar. They do it a, a bit more flair. I, I'm not able to do it so elegantly. You know, they like, you know, they, they got this really weird way of doing it. That is, uh, that's not necessary. It's just straight from the ears to, right, however you tie them. 
but you know this kind of thing is uh, is not necessary. It's just a habit that somebody may have observed somebody else doing and doing. I don't know if you're doing it. It's something to think about, right? Um, likewise, you know, all these weird ways that people do, you need to avoid them. It's just straightforward, law, right? It's just straightforward. Another thing is that when we start our prayer, right, when we start our salat. It mentions very clearly that the Allahu Akbar that we say, the takbir we say to enter the prayer, that first one is a fard, it's an integral of the salat. Which means, if you didn't say it, if you said it in your mind, which means you did not utter it with your tongue, your salat would not have even begun, even though you're doing all the postures now. One nutku fit takbiri, that's what they say. That it has to be articulated. That's why make an effort, make it a point that when you start your salat for that first one, you say Allahu Akbar and try to listen to yourself. That you say it loud enough to hear yourself. That way it's definite. So it needs to be articulated Allahu Akbar. Not that loud, but you know, loud enough that you yourself can hear. <coughs> then after that, there is qira'ah. This is very important. Qira'ah. Uh, uh, the uh, part of the integrals of the prayer, the arkan of the prayer, the, the absolute uh, pillars of the prayer, without which the pillar is, uh, without which the prayer is not valid. One is the um, one is qira, reciting something, right? Part of surah Fatiha, um, a surah, whatever recitation. Number two is ruku, prostration. Number three is, are the two sajdas, right? And number four. Uh, sorry, one, uh, one I missed out is the standing as well. The standing is a fault as well. And then uh, the, number five will be the sitting. Uh, as long as it takes to recite the shahud. That long, however long that is for each person, for that long to sit in the right raqqa, that is also a fault. So these are the fault. Many of the other things are wajib. To read the, read the Fatiha first, to read the Surah afterwards, uh, to make sure that they read in the first two rakats of a fard prayer and all the rakats of a nafil prayer or a sunnah prayer or to make sure that the surah comes after the fatiha and, uh, and then the tasbihat for example subhan rabbil azim subhan rabbil azim those are uh, mustahab and sunnah to read once at least and uh, that, that, so that those are not faraid but the main faraid are five and that's why we have to be really careful so standing everybody stands but in one case people will make a mistake in this You've just come into the masjid and you find that the Imam has just said Allahu Akbar and gone into Ruku. Now we know that the ruling is that if you catch the Imam in Ruku, you've caught that rakat. Now if you catch the Imam after that, that rakat of you is gone and you have to repeat that rakat. So what a lot of people do is that when they see that the Imam is in Ruku, they will rush to do this and it's not right to do this. It's been prohibited to run in the masjid for this purpose. The Prophet said very clearly that just take it easy. Whatever you catch, you pray, the other you make up afterwards. On one occasion, uh, in Masjid Nabawi, a person came in from the back and he saw that the Imam had gone into Ruku. So he started his prayer at the back, went into Ruku, and then like that he went forward. Right? Quite a few softs, quite a few rows. He went forward like that. And the Prophet explained to him afterwards that okay, this time it's fine, but this is not allowed to do that. Salat was still being, uh, still evolving at that time. Initially, it was permissible to speak in prayer. After that, it became impermissible. <coughs> On one occasion, after it became Im impermissible, one uh, Sahabi came in. He came in late. He asked the person, "He says, uh, how many, how many rakats have you done?" People used to ask that before, right? Because it was permissible in the beginning. So he asked, and the person did not respond to him. So he got quite upset. Why isn't he responding to me? Has he got a problem with me or something? After that, it was uh, announced that. This is now speaking in Salat has become prohibited. So slowly, slowly, the Salat came to be what we see as it is today. Otherwise, in the beginning, according to some riwayat, you were raising your hands before even sajda. In between the sajda as well, seven, ta seven times in one rakah, you'd raise your hands. According to some narrations, as mentioned in, uh, in the Shafu Ma'ali Al-Athar of Imam Tahawi. So eventually, it came to be as we see it today, right? With the differences that we still see. So now you've just come in. Number one, you should not rush. You should just take it easy and get there. Now what happens in many cases is that if the Imam has just gone into Ruku, what some people do is they say Allahu Akbar and they go directly into Ruku with that Allahu Akbar. That is not valid. The reason is that when you start the prayer, the Takbir has to be said in the standing. The Qiyam. 
so that at least your qiyam, which means your standing, for has been absolved in this regard. So essentially, this is what you would have to do. This is probably the fastest that you could do it, right? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. But you could not say Allahu Akbar because that your Allahu Akbar is then going to be counted for going into ruku. You have not said it standing up. You don't have to say Allahu Akbar and then wait. You could, you, as long as you say the full Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and then, so you've said it standing up. That's the minimum. Otherwise, your salat is not valid if you if you've jumped into ruku straight away. The second Allahu Akbar for going into ruku. For, uh, for going into sajda and so on, that's sunnah. So if you miss that, it wouldn't affect the prayer as such. So if you just said, Allahu Akbar, and then you just went down afterwards, that would be valid. Even without saying the second Allahu Akbar. Right? So get that right, because you, you have to say that Allahu Akbar standing up. That is very important. That's a major mistake that people make. Uh, people make. Uh, and that, the next one is, now you've started the salat your own salat. We're not praying behind the Imam anymore. Right? Because we, when the Imam is reciting, we don't read. In the Hanafi school, we're told not to read. Right? So we stay silent and we just, you can just concentrate on the Fatiha in your mind. You're not allowed to read with your tongue in the Hanafi school when the Imam is reading, whether it's a silent or a loud salat according to the strongest opinion. Whereas in the Shafi'i school and, uh, and uh, the other schools, uh, you, you have to read the Fatiha at least quickly and so on. That's another issue. That's, uh, you can read about the details of that elsewhere. But the, the other thing I was speaking about is that, let's do, say you're making your Sunnah prayer. Right? You're making your own Sunnah prayer. Allahu Akbar. And then you're just standing there. You see a lot of people, they'll just literally stand there. They will, their tongue will not move. Right? If, you're, if your tongue does not move throughout that rak'at and you have not read at least one rak'at with your tongue moving, then your salat is not valid. The reason is that reciting at least a significant verse or three small verses is a form in every rak'at. Or the first two rak'ats of a fard or every rak'at of a sunnah, uh, sunnah or nafil prayer. You have to recite at least Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. You know, some small amount. So if you haven't, if you've just thought of it, there's a difference between reading and thinking. We get really confused by the fact that when you read the newspaper, nobody reads it aloud. Nobody moves their lips. If somebody's reading a newspaper or a book and they're, they're moving their lips, you're going to think the guy's crazy. Right? Because normally that reading is just in your mind. But this is not reading, this is tilawa. See, in Arabic, there's two different words. One is qira, and the other one is Tilawa, tafakkur. There's many different words for this. What we're told to do here is tilawa, and tilawa means to actually articulate the letters of the Quran with your tongue. Now there are two opinions about what is the minimal amount that will consider that will make your tilawa to be considered valid. What is the minimum amount at which your tilawa, your recite, your recitation will be considered valid? The first opinion is that you must at least hear yourself. According to that opinion, if we're reciting in our salat and we're not listening, we can't hear ourselves, our salat is invalid. However, although that is an opinion we should follow, there is another opinion that we could go by if we've done this in the past. The second opinion is a lesser opinion. What that opinion is, is that as long as your tongue moves, as long as your tongue and lips move, it's valid even if you don't hear yourself. So if you're saying, that is valid, even if you can't hear yourself. But if you're just, or with the mouth open, it's not valid. Because that's not reading, that's thinking. So you're thinking through the Fatiha. You know, that's not valid. If you've got a habit of doing that, believe me, some people, I've, I've seen cases where they've done this for the last 20 years of their life. And nobody's told them. And now they've discovered it, Essentially, they have to do the qada of all of those prayers. If they have not at least moved their lips for at least one significant ayah in every rak'ah, they should be redoing their prayers. All right? That's why it's so important to learn these rules. What happens in many, many cases is that we learn these rules as young children in madrasa. It's one of the first things that we get taught. And after that, we forget about it. But that time, we're not really conscious. We're not really focused on prayer. Uh, you know, uh, our concentration isn't at that level. So I really think that as adults, we should pick up a detailed book on Salat and we should read it. Or we should take a class, really all of us. Because there are many small, small things that we will discover. 
small, small things that we will discover that may be critical. Inshallah, we shouldn't be doing the critical things. I'm mentioning the critical things. All right? So inshallah, we can avoid them. And I think every one of us should go and tell at least their families about all of these issues because it's salat and we don't want it uh, to be invalidated. Imagine somebody 20, 30 years, they're not reading. You know, subhanAllah. So you have to at least move your lips. And the next option is that you can at least hear yourself, but one of the two would suffice. Another thing which is a major problem uh, among us Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshis, subcontinent people, right? I don't know why. Um, I'm not sure if this is with other Hanafis as well, but especially the Hanafis of the Indian subcontinent, we've got a major problem with this, which is that when people come up for ruku, they don't really stand up properly. They go, Sami Allah, Allah, Hamida, Allahu Akbar. It is just like really smooth, you know, go up and go back down, don't stand there. Even between the two, uh, two sajdas, that you call that the jalsa. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. In fact, some people don't even sit, sit up properly. They just go, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Right? That one is not as critical as this recitation in the mind, but it does, it's, it's a missing of a wajib. So it's not a fard issue, but it's a wajib issue which means that every single salat of this person is deficient and they should be doing a sajda to sah these two, two sajdas that you do at the end they should be doing that because you're missing a wajib it's wajib to do what they call itmi'nan this is called itmi'nan or tumanina, which means repose to, to become tranquil the definition of this is that in every posture it is wajib that every part of your body returns to its place and becomes motionless which means in salat if I say uh, then I have to stand so that my entire body is now reposed in the sense that it's motionless then I can go on to my posture if I just go like this and then I carry on it means that I'm just using this as a transit and it's not working it's wajib which means you must do a sadr tilawa and believe me maybe half of our people have this problem just watch somebody's prayer and tell them nicely afterwards that this itmi'nan you, uh, you know, issue, we need to deal with this. The two main places where this is a problem is where there's no tasbih. Well, there is a tasbih, but I don't know, we just kind of incorporate it within the going up and going down. So, Sami'allahu liman hamida. Rabbana walakal hamna. If you've got a problem with this, extend your tasbih. This will, if you get a habit, if you develop a habit of reading a specific tasbih in that time, then uh, it will help you to stay motionless. So, Sami Allah bin Hamidah. You can say, Rabbana lakal hamd, Rabbana wa lakal hamd. Um, our Lord for you is all praise, and for you is all praise. That's the difference. Or, Allahumma Rabbana lakal hamd, Allahumma Rabbana wa lakal hamd. Or, Rabbana lakal hamdu, hamdan kathiran, tayyiban, mubarakan fi. On one occasion, a, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after the salat finished, he turned around, he said that, who is the one among you that read this dua? Because somebody had just made this dua up and read it. It was not something he'd heard from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rabbana wa So this sahabi said, I did. He said, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I saw this number of angels rushing to see who could write it down first in your book of good deeds. So that's a longer one which we should do, especially when we're not in a hurry, and it will help us to repose ourselves during that time. In between the two sajdas, there are also some mustahab du'as that are mentioned there as well. And we should make a habit of them so that we also have repose between the two sajdas. So, Allahu Akbar. And many people just go, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. But in this case, you say, Allahu Akbar. What's the du'a for that? Does anybody know? Rabbi Khilli, Warhamni, Wa'afini, Wahdini. There's two or three different versions, but uh, one of them is Rabbi Khilli, Warhamni, Wa'afini, Wahdini, Warzukni. There's one Wajburni. But you can do a combination of any of these. Right? It's mustahab, it's not sunnah, it's, it's established right, in ahadith and it, the main thing is that it will help you to repose because that's wajib. Now why is this an Indo-Pak problem? I think the reason why it's an Indo-Pak problem, Wallahu alam, is because it's not fard in our madhab, it's not fard in the Hanafis to do that uh, repose. In the Shafi'is it's fard to do that. So if, they did, if in the Shafi'i school you did not say, Samiullah, and you did not stand motionless for a while, your salat would be invalid. 
In the Hanafis, you can get away with it. deficient, it becomes naqis, it becomes incomplete. You lose your reward and it becomes incomplete, but it's still valid, right? Where do we get this from? There's a hadith which is related by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. Famous hadith, and many others have related this from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. Prophet once entered into the masjid, and another person also entered and began to make his salat. After he finished his salat, he came to the Prophet and made salam. The Prophet responded to his salam, and then he said, Go back and make your salat again because you haven't prayed yet. Meaning your prayers, you haven't prayed. So the person went back and he prayed just as he prayed the first time. Then he comes back to the Prophet makes salam again. And the Prophet ﷺ responds to his salam and then he says, Irjik, fasalli, fa inna kalam tusalli. Send it back. He said, go, go back and pray your salat you, because you haven't prayed your salat yet. He did this three times. Now this person then is wondering what's the problem. Right? Each time he went and did the same thing, he came back and the Prophet ﷺ is telling him to go back. So the third time he comes back and he says to the Prophet ﷺ, by the one who sent you with the truth, I don't know how to do better than this. So teach me. Right? This is the best that I can do. Now teach me what the issue is. So then the Prophet ﷺ said, When you start your prayer, then say Allahu Akbar. When you want to start your prayer, when you stand for the prayer, say Allahu Akbar, say the takbir, and then recite whatever you have of the Quran, you know, Surah with the uh, Surah Al Fatiha. And then after that, make your ruku. Then make ruku until you become you become reposed in your ruku, in your prostration, which means you become motionless in your ruku. Alright? You become motionless in your ruku and then raise yourself until you're fully straight. Until you're fully straight. Then make sajda until you fully make your sajda, until you fully reposed in your prostration and then sit down until you are fully tranquil in your seating between the two sajdas. Do we do that? That's something to think about, right? So this is clearly from the hadith diary. This is not just, you know, somebody made this up that it's necessary. It is actually necessary. And then go and make your second sajda like that with that tranquility. And then do this in all of your salat. Do this in all of your salat. So now you understand from this the importance of this, right? Now the Shafi'is have taken that to be so important that they've made it fault. Now there's a response that the Hanafis have as to why the Prophet he was trying to teach him, that's why he told him to make it again. It's not that his prayer was invalid, it was incomplete, that's why he was telling him to redo it. The Shafi'is say that his prayer was invalid, that's why the Prophet was telling him to make it, uh, make it again. Right? So uh, keep, keep that in mind because that is extremely important. What some people do is that they've managed to, over time, incorporate the three Subhanahu Rabbil Azims within the whole movement. Allahu Akbar Subhanahu Rabbil Azim, Subhanahu Rabbil Azim, Nisimi Allah Rabbil Azim. So, the, the Subhanahu, the Tasbih is done in, one is going, done going down, one is done while down, and the other one is done, so it's just like, we're very efficient. Lean production, right? La hawla wa la quwta illa billah, you can't do that in Salat. Salat, you, you, you just take time and everything as though you're a beginner. Right? As though you're a beginner. That's very important. Another thing that just uh, came to mind is that when we stand in our safs, that's another problem. It's the Imam's responsibility to make sure everybody's saf is straight. Right? So normally the first saf is, or the first row is always going to be nicely, tightly packed. Because the, what's the important thing is, is that the shoulders are together. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Hadu bayn al manakim. Level your shoulders together. When it comes to the feet, the thing about the feet you have to realize is that there's one hadith in which the Sahabi says, and he was a young Sahabi, he was a child at that time. He says that when the Prophet ﷺ told us to straighten up, I noticed that the Sahaba, that, we, that, that, that everybody put their feet together. Right? However, you do not find this mentioned again while in the Salat. You only find this mentioned at the beginning to make the straight rows. There is no mention of keeping the feet together in the Salat. Right? Absolutely no mention. In fact, in the narration of Abu Dawood, uh, Sunan Abu Dawood, a version of this narration, it says that I saw everybody joining their knees together as well. Nobody does that. But what the ulama have mentioned is that the purpose of this was in those days they didn't have lines on the ground. You know, we have mashallah, nicely marked lines on the ground. There it was just pebble sand, whatever it was, and you had to form your own straight. 
So one of the ways that they did this was to link their feet together to make sure that they were fulfilling what the Prophet ﷺ said. But you never hear that they did this in, in the prayer itself. There's no hadith about that. So essentially, if somebody wants to do it, they can do it. But don't insist on it. There's people who go around insisting on this. And if, if somebody doesn't want to do it, because at the end of the day, the sunnah way of standing is whatever is comfortable for a person to stand in. That's what uh, is the mashur in the Hanafi and the Shafi'i schools. Right? Joining the feet together is permissible if you want to do it. Right? But there is no proof that it was done in the prayer. Because if it was done in the prayer, then what about in the ruku? What about in the sajda? How do you keep it joined together? Right? There is no categorical narration about that. But it's one way of doing it. So what happens with some people is that the person next door likes to keep his feet, you know, slightly apart. So the person next to him will keep his feet now even more widely because he wants to join the other. It's not necessary. This concept that shaitan will come in between, that more relates to the shoulders, the person himself, not the feet. Right? Because if you notice, a lot of people that insist on this, they're more focused on their feet than their shoulders. Even when they pray alone, they will be praying with their legs wide. Even when they're praying their sunnahs alone. It's become a habit. Right? So as I said, there's nothing wrong with it, but you mustn't insist on it and, uh, and, and irritate somebody else if they don't want to do it because it's not necessary. And nowhere does it mention that it's necessary. Right? However, the shoulders must be together. And that is a problem that we have. Many people accept the first role, which mashallah, because people recognize that there's lots of rewards of people kind of trying to get in there. You know, there's less space in the first role because everybody wants to get in the first role. After that, what happens is that people are leaving, people don't want to be in first class. Right? You notice people want to be, they don't want to be next to anybody. So even if you come and the, the, the row is there, right, you leave some space. I mean, don't do that. It's your brother. Right? Be together. I heard that where women come to the masjid, they're even worse than this. Right? Uh, uh, you know, my wife, and she's, been, she's, she's mentioned that they, they, they were, they're sitting on different uh, rows. Especially those that don't go to the masjid too often, when they actually go, they're like, they don't want to sit next to anybody. They want to pray alone in one self, another person here, another person here. If you, if the women are going to the masjid, whether you in, whether it's in Makkah, Mukarramah, or anywhere else, you need to be standing in row as well. There's no first class here, right? First class is that you be with everybody. The shoulder needs to be linked, uh, uh, touching together. That's the main thing. Another problem which many people are aware of is the short garments that people wear. So they're wearing trousers or pants or whatever it is, but then their top is a bit short. So when they go into Ruku, um, the trousers slip down. And according to some people, it could be as much as the Grand Canyon, right? Uh, there was a Maulana, he was with us in Ertikaf last year, he says, uh, the Grand Canyon showing, I have to, you know, the Grand Canyon showing every day. The Grand Canyon is in America, by the way. Um, so anyway, it's, it's, it's wrong to do that. It should, be, it should be up, right? It should be up. And the thing is that why do you want to wear such short clothing? Because then you've got some people, what they do is, you know, it's like women with the, the hijabs that are not on properly. So every few moments you have to keep making sure it's straight. It's just such a hassle, isn't it? It's makru in the salat to wear a shawl or something where both sides of it are dangling down. The reason is that it's going to occupy you because you have to be managing that all the time because it's going to keep flipping all over the place and you have to keep managing it. So that's why it's makru to wear a shawl that has the two sides dangling down. If just one side is fine. But two sides because it's very distracting. <coughs> Similarly, if a person doesn't have the clothing on properly and, and every time they're having to pull it up or push something down in every ruku, it's just ridiculous. You're there for the salat, you should be prepared for it so that you can do a stress-free prayer. You should be a uniform for it. That's how much it is. In fact, you know what? The fuqaha have mentioned that it is makru to pray salat in any clothing like your night dress you know, your pajamas, that you would not want to be seen in public with. Because Salat is a place of honor which you're standing in front of your Lord. So you don't want to just be standing in some kind of, you know, weird clothing to do that. Right, so that's something else to take into consideration. The fiqhi aspect of that is that if one quarter of the bottom is exposed for the duration of three subhanallah, 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 then the Salat will be invalidated. But if only 
less than a quarter of it is exposed, then it's makru, it's wrong, it's bad, but the salat would still be valid. Right? That's why when I mentioned this to that one, one person, he said, you're telling me the Grand Canyon is showing and his salat is valid? Right? You know, unfortunately, yes, that's, that's, that's what it is, but it's bad. It's bad. It's a bad habit, and it's really bad for the person behind, the people behind you as well. So have some, have some sense, right, for yourself and for, and for others as well. You know, leave your gangster's lifestyle outside. Uh, just in that regard, uh, transparent clothing is not considered concealment, right? That's more of an issue with women, right? So that will not be considered valid uh, in terms of the body being covered. But then there's another issue, and I know that there's no women here, but you can tell this to your women for, especially if, they, if, if, uh, in, uh, if they've got an issue with this, which is that sometimes women are wearing tights or um, leggings or something of that nature, meaning something that is exposing the curves of the body. Now, if it's not see-through, then the salat will be valid, but it will be makru. So it's, it's prohibitively disliked, makru tahrimi, to expose any part of the body that needs to be covered, right? To, uh, to expose the form of it, even though it's concealed. So even with men, if you've got tight leggings on, you're praying salat in that, the, uh, the thigh part and the knee part needs to be covered, right? So if that part is tight, then that will not be valid. So if you're, if you're into these tight jeans or whatever it is that people wear, right, that could be a problem. Right? You should look at that, that could be a problem. Because the men's, uh, the men's uh, part that has to be concealed is from the navel to below the knees. But for the women, it's the whole body except the face, hands uh, and, uh, uh, and feet. Another problem. People going to Sajda. And I don't know if they've got an imbalance in their center of gravity or something, right? But they go into Sajda, they go into prostration, and their feet go up. Their feet just can't stay down if their head is down. Center of gravity problem. Go somewhere and get it oriented. Right? You know, I don't know if they orient these things, but you know, like you have wheel alignment. You know, I think we need something like that done. But seriously, some people, they go into Ruku, they put their, uh, their hands down and their head down, and their feet go up. And that's wrong as well. If the feet have stayed up for that entire duration, as soon as the head went down, the feet went up, and they stayed up until you came back up, your, your sajda would be invalid. Because sajda means that at least one foot is touching the ground, a knee, and the, the forehead, and the, and, the, and the palms. So in this case, everything else is, but the feet have suddenly gone up for some reason, they're, they're tired. Right? That's completely wrong. So. Aside from that, I mean, we're just talking about at least touching the ground. Then there's the problem of how people are touching the ground. How people are placing their, uh, their toes. So some people are just keeping them straight. That's makru as well. They should actually be uh, folded towards the qibla. They should be folded towards the qibla, and it's the bottom part of those toes that should be touching the ground. Right? It's the bottom part of that that should be touching the ground. Otherwise, that's makru as well, just to be like that. Or to be like that. Right? Which means that the surface the top surface is touching the ground, that would be invalid as well. Another thing is that if you've got a turban on, uh, uh, an imam on, right, and if you're making sajda with that, as long as, let's just say that the turban is, uh, you know, on the forehead, right, it's part of the forehead, and if you're doing sajda on the turban, but it's on the part which is below the forehead or above the forehead, your, salat, your sajda would be valid because the forehead is essentially, you know, touching the ground through something. Right? But if the turban is above the hairline, above the forehead essentially, and then, the, and then somebody's doing sajda in, uh, in this weird way where they're doing it on their turban and not on their forehead, that would be invalid. But that's not such a big problem. People don't do that. This feet issue, watch it. This is something very difficult to determine for yourself. So that's something I would really suggest that you make a list of these things if you have a doubt about yourself and just tell somebody to watch you when you pray. Right? Seriously, you'd, thank, you'd be really thankful because we don't want to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter and we've prayed every single prayer. Oh, but that one wasn't valid, that one wasn't valid, that was deficient, that was a problem. Subhanallah, that's going to be really sad. In ibadah, we want to do it as best as possible. Forearm on the ground. Now again, that's a major issue. So many people are doing this. I don't know why. Big, big people are doing this. Right? You see this. This is, a, this is such a big issue. Right? Going to Sajda, and these are not all people that have a problem. Now, Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani has mentioned that if you've got a problem, right, 
uh, and you're old and you can't keep them up, then rest them on your knees. But don't rest them on the ground because the hadith is prohibiting it. Right? Now what about women? Right? Because women are told to contract themselves and be as, com uh, as compact as possible in their sajda. There's a hadith in Muslim which says that your men should not do this. Essentially, essentially precluding women. <coughs> so women are allowed to touch their, uh, to keep their forearms on the ground, but I would still suggest that they don't keep it on the ground, but they kind of keep it on their sides. Because the hadith, not all the hadith preclude the women. But the one hadith in Muslim does, in Sahih Muslim does. Right? So I would still say that they kind of keep it off the ground slightly, but to, to, together to themselves. But that's something which is, again, as I said, a major issue in the men, and, and we should uh, notice that. Another thing is that there's a fallacy that Maghrib Salah is only valid for up to like 15-20 minutes after the starting prayer time and once after that then it's Qadha, that it's missed. But that's not true. Yes, it's Makru the more you delay it. So the more you delay it, it becomes Makru. But until the time of Isha begins, whatever time that is, Maghrib time is valid. So if you haven't made your Maghrib yet for whatever reason, you came back home, you're, you know, you're from a journey or whatever it is, you should still pray, it's not qada, it's still ada. It's still valid until Isha time. Finally, two more issues. One is, I was standing next to somebody in Salat, in Taraweeh, right, some years ago. And in one standing, he was moving around at least five times, on average. So, So, after the Salat, I told him, you should repeat your prayer. I told him nicely, you should repeat your prayer. Because your movements are considered excessive. Because the hukum in here, the ruling here, is that if your movement alien to the prayer, right, that's not part of the prayer, is long enough for you to say, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. That's about three and a half seconds or so. Your Salat would be invalid. Another definition is that if somebody came in and they saw you like that and they thought you're not in the prayer, your salat is invalid. Because if they saw you like that, they think you're in the prayer. But if they saw you like this, they might not think you're in the prayer. But that's, you don't go by that, you just go by the fact that any movement that's beyond the movement of the prayer, that is for three subhanAllah long, your prayer would be invalidated. Some people have a habit of this, it's not out of necessity that they're scratching. Because after I told him, the next two rakats when he was praying, this is how he was. It was really classic. He was like... <laughs> right? You could tell the guy was jerking and he was moving back. It was a habit. You don't have to move yourself. And shaitan, there's a special shaitan that's designated to give you doubts in your wudu. Right? Walahan. And a special shaitan with a name in the hadith, Khinzab. Right? That is designated to cause you problems in prayer. To spoil your prayer. So it makes you itch and suddenly you start praying, you don't have an itch and you suddenly start itching. You know, you suddenly start itching in all sorts of places. And the more you scratch, the more you, it just becomes, just avoid it, just stand it, just avoid it. Otherwise, it could break your brain. Now, th there's another fallacy, which is that if I, uh, if I really had to move, make a move and I went like this, and then after a while, uh, you know, I, I had to scratch the same place again, and a third time, my salat would break. It would not. Essentially, you don't, you don't accumulate the movements. It's one movement if it extends to three subhanallah. Because there are a lot of people that have come and say, my salah is broken. I said, why? Because I moved three different times. No. If your one movement was as long as three seconds of three subhanallah, that would break it. But not otherwise. Alright? Not, not if it was. But it's makru to keep moving anyway. And finally, the last thing. And this is uh, um, Ramadan. Mashallah, we're trying to accumulate many good deeds for ourselves, reading lots of Quran, making our salat in the masjid, and taraweeh and fasting and so on. There is one thing that we need to do. We need to think back. Now listen to this carefully. We need to think back from the time that we became mature, which means when you were 13 or 14 years of age. If you can't remember exactly, at least from when you were about 14. Because the, the, the age of maturity for people who don't see a wet dream and so on, for men who don't see a wet dream or so on, is 14 years and 7 months uh, Gregorian which is 50, equivalent to 15 years Islamic, right? So, wait, since you're 13, 14 years old, think back to how many salats you may have missed. And make a note of it. Make a record of it. 
I've probably missed, okay, you know, 300. I remember that one year I didn't pray Fajr at all. 355 Fajrs, for example. Dhuhr, I used to make most of the time, but I probably missed it about five weeks. Okay, write that down. Asr, you know, sometimes I do, you know, coming back from work, I miss Asr like that. So you make that, you know, you make a list. Make a list of all of the prayers that we have missed in the past. And let's start making them up. Because that is necessary. There's a consensus of the ulama on that. With only very few detractors. Ibn Hazm al-Zahiri was the detractor. Right? <coughs> For example, Imam Nawi makes it very clear that the ulama have agreed on this fact. That if you miss a prayer, even purposely, you have to make it up. And then you do tawbah. Ibn Hazm al-Zahiri, his opinion was that the prayer time is gone. There's no way you can re-get that prayer. Because you can't. Because, you know, that time is gone, right? That's why even with a fasting, the Prophet ﷺ said that if you miss a fast without a valid excuse, then if you fasted for the rest of your life out of Ramadan, you would not be able to make up that same reward for that one fast that you missed in Ramadan. That's how much reward there is concentrated. But you make qada. Because as the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that if you miss fast because you're traveling or sick or whatever, you'll make it up on other days. For Hajj, somebody had missed a Hajj, somebody's mother had missed a Hajj. The person came to the Prophet and said, my mother has missed Hajj, she would have prayed, she would have done it if she had time. Okay, do it on her behalf. We learn from these that even if Salat is missed on purpose, you have to redo it. But what the people who, there are, there is a group of people today that like to follow Ibn Hazm's opinion and say that if you've missed your prayer, then there is no way that you should, uh, there, there's no way that you can redo it and to rectify that. You just have to make tawbah and do other good worship so that it's, uh, it, you know, it's, uh, it balances it out in the hereafter. That is an absolute isolated opinion. The opinion, as mentioned by Qurtubi, as mentioned by Nawawi, is that the ijma of the, not just the four schools, but the ulama in general is that whether you miss your salat by mistake, out of forgetfulness, or on purpose, in fact, even more so if you miss it on purpose, you have to redo it. Because the Prophet did qada prayer. On one occasion, they had stopped somewhere at, uh, uh, before Fajr. They'd been traveling at night, people were tired. They camped somewhere and he told uh, Bilal radiallahu anh, to stay awake and wake everybody up when it's Fajr time. Poor Bilal radiallahu anh, also fell asleep. And what woke them up was when the sun came up. So that's when everybody woke up. They missed their Fajr. So they made a jama'ah of Fajr after sunrise. During the battle of the trench, three salats were missed. And Umar was swearing at the kuffar. They made me miss my salat. They made me miss my salat. And the Prophet said, they made, they made qada prayer. Why can't we find any evidence for if the salat is missed on purpose, then you should make it up? Why can't we find evidence? I would think that it's virtually impossible to find that. The reason is that even the munafiqeen were praying salat in the time of Rasulullah. They weren't just praying salat, they were praying it in the masjid. Totally different from our situation. Yes, alladinu ma'an salatihim sahun, alladinuhum yura'un. They used to lounge around at the back, but they would still come for the masjid, to the masjid. Because if they didn't, they would be immediately known as certified munafiqeen. Just to make sure that there's doubt about them, they would still come for the, uh, come for the salat. So missing salat was uh, just very difficult during that time to do. Right? The Prophet ﷺ never missed salat on purpose, so there's never an example that you find a hadith, oh, the Prophet ﷺ missed salat on purpose and remade it. You just can't find a dalil for that. We find that the need for missing a fast that you make it up in the Quran. We uh, for for missing a Hajj uh, for not doing a Hajj you can redo it. What about Salat? <coughs> That's an ijma. So that is make it up. Now the thing is that you might be thinking, you know, some people might have five years of Salat to make up. Don't worry about it. Don't find it daunting. Make a record and start making it up. Maybe what you could do is you could sometimes what you could do is you could make one Salat with each Salat. So with every Fajr you can do a Fajr with, uh, of Qadha. Also, the other thing is that it's makru to make nafil or sunnah prayer uh, aside from the sunnahs of Fajr during Fajr time in the Hanafi school. It's makru to make any other nafil prayer. But it's permissible to make qada prayer. So after you finish your Fajr uh, uh, for you can make qada prayer until sunrise. Right? Likewise, after Asr, right? At this time, for example, it's makru to make sunnah prayer. Right? But it's permissible to make qada prayer until about 15 minutes before sunset. So there's a lot of leeway for qada prayer. Another way that's very easy that you could do as well, is that you can say, okay, I'm going to get all my fajrs out of the way. So in one day, I'm going to do 10 extra fajrs, 10 times 2. You don't have to do the sunnah qada, you only have to do the fard rak'ats. You only have to remake those. So I'm going to do 10 times 2 rak'ats in a day, sometimes with fajr, with dhuhr, with asr, with maghrib. You can't miss your sunnah mu'akkada to do qada prayers in the Hanafi school. In the Shafi'i school, you must. 
But what the Shafi'i say is that if you've got qada prayers, you better make them up. You can't do sunnah until you make qada. But in the Hanafis, sunnah mu'akkadah is so important that you must make the sunnah mu'akkadah for before dhuhr, for example, to after dhuhr. But for the nafil, you can replace the nafil prayer, you can replace the hajjah prayer, you can replace awabin, you can replace sunnah mu'akkadah. The non emphasized sunnah, like four akas before us. So when you get up for the hajjah in Ramadan, do qada prayers instead. You'll get the reward, inshallah, for the hajjah as well because it's night time. Right? But do this, make a, make, a, make a plan for this. And if we die in between and we haven't finished, we can at least talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and look, I started, but death caught me before I was able to do it. And believe me, there are people who've done five, six, ten years of qada, and mashallah, they've done it. And they've thrown a party at the end of it as well. Because it's worth doing. Right? And make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq to correct our prayers, to refine our prayers, and to make, not allow them to be an autopilot, to make a first class prayer all the time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq, this is the first thing that we will be asking about Allah in the hereafter.